Once again, good morning, good afternoon, good evening from wherever you are joining this in our second webinar of this two part series, uh, New Technologies and Methodologies for Explosive Ordnance Risk Education, a view from other sectors organized by the Geneva International Center for Humanitarian Demining. Thank you for joining us today to explore digital initiative and solutions developed by other sectors to engage with and meet the needs of affected communities. Uh, my name is Rijn Vogelaar, I'm the First Secretary at the Permanent Mission of the Kingdom of the Netherlands, and it's my honor on behalf of the Netherlands to moderate uh, this second webinar. Uh, for the Netherlands, innovation is one of the three priority teams during our presidency of the Anti-Personnel Mine Bank Convention in 2021. Innovation is a key driver for progress, and while the mine action sector continues to innovate on areas such as demining, land release, stockpile destruction, victim assistance, and risk education. It is always good to learn from other sectors and see how they innovate by using new technologies to achieve their goals. Today's webinar is built on the first held webinar two weeks ago, entitled Digging Deeper Through Behavioral Change, in which behavioral change was explored from different angles and from other sectors. For those who have missed that, missed that webinar, a link to the recording of that webinar will be provided in the chat by the organizers. Today, we will look at and learn from digital initiatives developed by non-mine action organizations. We hope that the presentations offered today will inspire explosive ordnance risk education practitioners, promote and scale up innovative approaches or simply trigger new ideas and create new collaborations and partnerships. Our format of today's webinar will be a series of short presentations by our seven panelists, followed by a round of questions. We are aware that we will not be able to answer all the questions today, but please do not stop uh, make that stop you from putting them in the Q&A um, below. Uh, because uh, we will try to do the best efforts uh, also to answer the questions uh, during the presentation in the chat, or if not possible, uh, at a later stage uh, in written format. Um, with that brief introduction, uh, allow me to briefly go through the logistics of this webinar. Um, as you can see, all participants are on mute and their cameras have been switched off and this will uh, remain so throughout the webinar. However, if you have any questions, uh, please use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen uh, to, uh, to put any questions to any panelist. Um, together with the team, we will monitor, monitor the Q&A throughout uh, the session and see what we can answer in the chat. And also at the end during the Q&A, we will try to uh, uh, address some of the questions, although we are aware that time is limited. Also, please be advised that we are recording this session and that it will be shared later. Um, with these uh, remarks, allow me now to open really the interesting part of this webinar, namely the presentations. And it's my honor to first introduce Mathieu Laruel, who is an advisor for explosive ordnance risk education at the GICHD. His presentation will focus on the key findings of the review with regards to digital used tools used in the sector. Mathieu, the floor is yours. Thank you, Reint. Um, and good morning, good afternoon, everyone. Um, I would start with a question. Um, what if and um, what if we could unleash the power of innovation in the explosive ordnance risk education sector? Well, the good news is that EORI has started surfing on this wave with a growing number of digital initiatives in the past years. And I will briefly illustrate this by sharing a few examples and findings on the use of digital tools in the risk education sector that are outlined in chapter one of the review on new technologies and methodologies for risk education that was published end of last year and that you can access on the slide, on the website that you see on the slide. So at the time of the research, we found that there were five broad categories of technologies being used for risk education, which you can see here. Social media campaigns were reported as the most commonly um, tools used um, to reach a wide variety, sorry, to um, reach um, large numbers of people, especially youth. 
they have the advantage of reaching people directly where they are and they are easily scalable and cost effective. Unlike printed materials, um, digital content can also be easily updated to adapt to changing circumstances um, like new contamination or movement, rapid movement of populations, which is important in our sectors and in environments that change rapidly. The review also shows that digital campaign um, seem to be most effective um, when a wide variety of tools are combined using social media platforms um, and uh, other edutainment or interactive game-based learning uh, approaches. Digital apps have been increasing use as well, but it's important to include in that case uh, a budget and a plan for marketing the app to its intended target audience. You also see on the slide that augmented and virtual reality are also fields in full expansion that can contribute to the promotion of safe behaviors. The most recent example is from UNICEF, together with the IT Ukraine Association. Um, they have created a virtual reality experience to promote safe beha behaviors among children in Eastern Ukraine. Now, sending life-saving information through SMS is still often, or was still often reported to be the most preferred channel. Um, also pre-recorded audio messages uh, were used on microcards in vehicle transporting people through loudspeakers or radio stations. And then finally, the risk education talking device initially used in South Sudan and developed by UNMAS is also a great example of um, low technology. It's a so solar powered device that allows to upload pre-recorded messages, um, songs, dramas, interviews, uh, focus group discussion, especially for audiences with no to low connectivity, uh, low literacy levels, and uh, often oral traditions. Now, practitioners we interviewed for this review highlighted the importance of upholding the same principles as with conventional risk education at the moment of creating digital responses. And in that sense, digital risk education intervention should be based on a needs assessment. Um, that also integrates gender and diversity considerations. And by this, I mean looking at factors such as impairment, age, language, uh, literacy, displacement status, uh, rural, urban location, etc. It also means looking at gender norms or what is expected from girls, boys, women, and men in specific contexts. I mean, we all know that social media. Uh, use can vary widely between regions uh, and demographic groups. Something else that was mentioned is that tech tools must also be um, field tested and piloted uh, prior to uh, being used widely. Security elements and do no harm um, also need to be considered. Is the information sensitive and will it put will it put communities at risk of reprisals? Are there restrictions against the use of certain devices? Do people have access to internet and smartphones, etc.? All these questions have to be, we have to ask ourselves all, the, all these questions in the process. Another key element highlighted by uh, people we interviewed is the role of trust. Um, digital tools work best when an organization has a relationship with the communities and the audience and where mutual trust has already been established. So all these elements I mentioned here um, were highlighted as key to ensuring that digital responses are effective. So I'm also emphasized on the fact that digital campaigns should generally complement and not substitute other risk education activities, including face-to-face -face, uh, ones. And other common factors between operators that develop digital projects include the fact that they have adopted an internal culture of innovation. Uh, it may be through the appointment of um, a dedicated staff who explores new solutions, expand networks with other sectors and creates uh, an innovation ecosystem within the organization and with others. This said, we're also reminded, reminded by people that innovation does not just mean um, adopting the latest technology. Uh, being innovative also means reevaluating our practice uh, when the context is changing, 
developing stronger community-based approaches and creating specific low-tech responses. And this is especially relevant in COVID times where uh, there's always a risk of not being able to access, uh, gain access to communities. We've seen also that organizations that innovate encourage collaboration and they create strategic partnerships with locally led organizations and other, sector, and other sectors um, to build on their expertise, build on their know-how and to accelerate uh, breakthrough solution, solutions. And there's many examples in the risk education sector of that. And finally, um, to conclude, the review has shown that meaningful two-way communication through digital means is possible and desired, and that using existing platforms that address multiple risks, such as your report and signpost that we'll see later have uh, great potential, but these avenues haven't really been explored by uh, the risk education sector for now. So just to conclude, um, the question is not really what if we could unleash the power of innovation, but rather how do we get better at engaging communities at risk through digital innovation? How do we scale up? How do we exchange lessons learned? And how do we partner beyond, beyond our, um, our sector? Thanks, back to you, Reint. Thank you, Macho, for this uh, presentation and giving us an overview of uh, what the review already uncovered. Um, it's now time indeed to, to look to the other sectors. And um, next speaker is uh, Fata Wuri, who is currently um, the Emergency Specialist Digital Engagement Lead in the Accountability and Affected Popula Population and Protection from Sexual Exploitation and Abuse Teams uh, at UNICEF. Uh, Fata, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, can you see my screen, everyone? Yes, it's perfect. Okay, great. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, colleagues from joining from all over. Um, and thank you, uh, Matthew, for such an, I think, grounded overview. A lot of the principles and the feedback that you spoke of so eloquently are also considerations that we think about when we, we employ digital tools for risk communication and community engagement. So for the next couple of minutes, I will just share with you our approach um, as well as how we think about it and how we leverage digital tools like your reports, which I'll speak a bit about, and Internet of Good Things and, and our overall uh, UNICEF incubated tools um, and their use not only in development programming in terms of how we reach, engage, and shape, and shift, and measure behavior, um, but also, um, uh, you know, how we go about really ensuring that it is driven by programs. I think one of the points that you raised that the, the strength of digital and innovation doesn't occur in a vacuum, but rather it is it goes to enhance the program design uh, for us to reach our aims. So some of the ways we think about how we, we use digital tools at UNICEF is being really clear that you know, our incubated tools are not representative of all the digital platforms and or solutions. So no one needs to really feel intimidated by the fact that you know, every, any or single organization has the tool, but it's really thinking about what is out there and what is best suited to the context, um, including government owned solutions and, um, uh, on, and their own applied solutions and mechanisms if we're thinking about systems building and we're also thinking about sustainable solutions. We recognize the gap for better integration and linkages between UNICEF platforms and any type of platforms um, and content with government owned digital platforms and solution for, for sustainable growth and scale. When we think about design and implementation considerations and the opportunity for growth and how we think about scaling up, we think about gender, uh, the reach and engagement. How are we engaging adolescent girls versus women? And how are we thinking about the gender digital divide? And what do we do within the innovation ecosystem that is bigger than digital to bridge that? And I think uh, Matthew you spoke a little bit about it. How do we merge face to face as well um, with, with perhaps SMS? We think about safety, child safeguarding, data protection, and really take um, risk mitigation uh, measures um, to ensure that we do no 
harm. Another consideration is um, the infrastructure investments. You know, what are, from the onset of program design, we're thinking about sustainability modalities uh, for UNICEF and also government owned platforms. It's great to start something, it's great to come with the ideas and the energy, but we need to ensure from the onset that we're thinking about costing, applicability, context, and all these other considerations so that we can see high impact programming over time. And of course, the big digital divide that we're constantly having conversations about, how do we bridge that through programming? How do we identify opportunities where in digital, digital platforms and tools can facilitate deepened offline programming um, and, and also, I think just bringing people who are, who are accustomed, our colleagues that are accustomed to digital, uh, to, to, to traditional programmatic ways and programming ways to say that digital can really offer an opportunity and to explain and to unpack its comparative advantages. So what we try to talk about is what our digital platforms do really well, or in general, what they do well is they, they broadcast information and engage users for positive behavioral change um, in, in, in rapid speed. We can act, we can send life-saving information and I'll share some examples and how we've done that in different contexts. Um, for COVID, we've seen how we've been able to track rumors and deal with misinformation and disinformation that's circulating, um, channel essential instructions at the onset of an emergency, preparedness, response, and provide learning content and support to targeted uh, population areas. So for example, frontline workers, healthcare workers, uh, not just youth and women and or the, or beneficiary communities, but also uh, um, targeted approaches to community members that are part of, of, of providing services. Uh, we try to produce large data sets um, and, and we're able to receive and disseminate and analyze and collect um, data in, for real-time monitoring and real-time response, at least in a, in a rapid manner, but one that can help inform decision-making. Um, we constantly look at the increase of, you know, ways to increase quality, timeliness, targeting, um, taking a targeted approach, and of course, the coverage of social services. So we can use digital tools, whether it's GIS mapping, whether it's U-Report, Internet of Good Things, to map social services around and be able to, to help, again, inform um, response. And then track uh, targets in relation to programmatic goals and identify gaps in terms of coverage and equity. I want to start by giving you an example by saying, given those considerations and the way in which we think about design for COVID, um, it was the first time within our own infrastructure that um, most of UNICEF's big, big digital um, platforms came together and take a, took a coordinated approach um, to try to strengthen coordination between the platforms um, and, and the digital uh, uh, capabilities to respond to the COVID um, crisis. Um, and what we ended up seeing was huge representation, as you can see um, down the, this column, in terms of the representation cross-divisionally. And we were able to really streamline, systemize, provide timely support, infrastructure, resources, uh, technical notes to country level, to countries to be able to implement. And that um, collaboration internally was really critical. We also were able to divide in three um, um, subgroups that were big three thematic areas around rumor tracking, digitally enabled messaging, um, which is different from how we, we may do it traditionally. And then of course, ensuring that all of this data that we're receiving is feeding with, uh, into institutional processes. Um, at UNICEF, what we 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 mean we have lots of like I said, this this by no means represents all the digital platforms that we have, but of course, you report um, oh, one minute. Okay, sorry. So your report being one of our, our premier tools is a social messaging tool, real time tool existing in over 80 countries. We're now reaching, I think, um, close to, I mean, over 15 million people globally. Um, and then there's Internet of Good Things, which really is meant to reach the last mile, um, providing content information to 1 million users monthly. And so we try to outline the ways in which the, the normative ways in which programs can leverage digital tools for preparedness, assessment, community feedback, feedback, social research, and more importantly, risk communication, as you see in this in this fora, risk education, risk communication and community engagement in the provision of information, learning. But when we talk about meaningful engagement, how do we do that through gamification, linguistically, um, term, through the terminology that we use, the way in which we get people to feel safe um, with the content that 
they're receiving, and of course, provide referral services. So this, sec this slide here just sort of attributes um, in practice the digital tools that help programs deliver. Just really quickly, I know that I have to wrap up, but just in terms of use cases for COVID, we built a chat bot on UReport, um, which is UNICEF's, like, like I said, social messaging tool. Um, and we were able to reach 65 countries, translated in over 20 um, languages, um, and at the end, I mean, these are old figures, but it really was, but it was localized context. So countries were able to get a localized chatbot that they could basically send um, COVID reliable COVID information via SMS, as well as the fact that we integrate UReport in various social media platforms. And so we could reach more people, which was really, really important, as well as, you know, having partnerships with voice uh, type of uh, voice communication to also ensure that those that are illiterate are getting the information that they need. So I will just go down really quickly. I wanted to quickly share what we did in Northeast Nigeria as well, where we built an information center on the very same platform. Um, and we were responding to internally displaced people over 200 150,000 of them were receiving information in real time, providing life-saving information, getting their feedback on social services, providing that information to all the, 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 the sectors that were responding, health, wash, education, as well as our network of CSOs, opening cases and really ensuring that communities felt heard, felt seen, and were being responded to. All right, so I'll stop here and I'm open for questions um, in the chat as they may come. So uh, thank you so much. And I look forward to, to hearing from the rest of my colleagues. Over. No, thank you, Fatou. That was a very interesting presentation in which you uh, both gave the, the broader context of uh, how to use digital tools and also how they can provide uh, feedback from the communities uh, which we try to reach and, and try to affect. Um, now turning to our next speaker, um, it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Brianna Orr. Uh, she is Responsive Information Service Advisor in, at the International Rescue Committee, where she supports teams around the world in designing and implementing digitally enabled information services under the Signpost program, uh, which Mathieu already mentioned. So Brianna, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Um, all right, uh, please just bear with me while I share my screen. Um, is this working? Can you all see a PowerPoint? Yes, if you can only put it on a bigger screen. That was one of the questions we got in the chat. Yep, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, Yes. Wonderful. Okay, great. Um, I have my, my notes on another computer, so apologies if I'm kind of glancing away from the camera here and there. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you so much for having me on this panel, um, and good morning from Brooklyn. Uh, I'm going to talk uh, about the program that I work on, which is called uh, Signpost, to give a, a brief overview of what Signpost is, our history, where we operate now, and then talk concretely about how, how it works, um, the approaches that we use, the components that make up Signpost, uh, and then finally end with how we think about impact and how we, we are trying to measure impact. So Signpost is a digitally delivered responsive information service that provides accurate, accessible, and timely information to people in crisis so that they can know and exercise their rights, access essential services, and stay safe. We are working to overcome what we see as common obstacles to information delivery in the humanitarian sector and humanitarian response, which can often be unidirectional and top down. So to the point to some of the things Fatu spoke to using the languages that uh, humanitarian providers choose, the platforms that work for them, um, rather than what's preferred by communities. So we really try to meet people on the platforms and spaces where they already are looking for and sharing information. Um, and when we are working digitally, what that often means is social media. We're talking about Facebook or WhatsApp um, most frequently, sometimes SMS. 
Uh, we are also working to create information products based on the questions that we hear from affected communities, rather than what we decide in advance or assume that they need to know. And we also really take seriously that our role is to empower people to make their own decisions, whatever those may be, rather than uh, tell them what we think is best. So here I'm gonna talk a little bit about the history of Signpost. Uh, we started as Refugee Info in Greece in 2015 at a time when, as many of you likely remember, thousands of asylum seekers and migrants were arriving on the Greek islands every day. Uh, many of these asylum seekers had cell phones and were looking to connect to Wi-Fi so that they could figure out where they needed to go to see a doctor, to apply for asylum, what steps they needed to follow to reunite with family in, in Germany or elsewhere in Europe. Um, and, IRC and Mercy Corps were among the first INGOs responding on the ground, with Mercy Corps providing Wi-Fi hotspots. So we partnered with them to pair that Wi-Fi response with an information platform where people could go to find out some of these things and to submit questions and get individualized uh, support and responses from trained, what we call social media moderators, uh, but members of the community who are trained to help people navigate through that information. So Refugee Info in Greece was, was a really big success. At one point, we reached an estimated 65% of the refugee population at the time. Um, and on the back of that success, uh, refugee info spread to Italy and to the Balkans, where it was active in Serbia and Bulgaria. And there was also recognition both from IRC and Mercy Corps that a lot of these approaches could be applied to other uh, humanitarian contexts, crisis contexts where we work. And so that was where Signpost was born as an umbrella initiative. So now in 2021, uh, we have 12, uh, 12 programs in 12 countries, um, in five continents, uh, and uh, we continue to be active as Refugee Info in Greece and Italy. There we operate in Arabic, Farsi, Urdu, French, English, and we also have some content in Somali, uh, Lingala, and Karanji. Um, in El Salvador, as well as in Honduras and Guatemala, we have Quentinos, helping people who are displaced internally, as well as those who've been uh, deported or returned to navigate um, gang controlled environments and just an insecure, uh, insecure settings. Uh, Info Palante serves displaced Venezuelans in Colombia. Uh, sticking with Latin America, we have Info Digna, which covers uh, Mexico's northern border with the US and which is really about helping people to, to navigate uh, very frequently um, changing border policies and, and safety considerations. Uh, in Anbar in Iraq, Simat Bata addresses issues around housing and land and property rights for returning populations. And then our signpost program in Bolo started with a focus on COVID in urban areas, really helping people to kind of navigate uh, restrictions and deal with um, a lot of uh, limited service access as services were um, shut down. Um, but uh, has in recent uh, months kind of moved towards uh, doing more work around identity, helping people access identity documents um, and guiding them through that process. And that was really driven by, by need. Um, and then finally, we have uh, new programs starting in Kenya, uh, Niger and Bangladesh very soon. So Signpost brings together a number of, of key element, elements um, in terms of how we deliver. On the technology side, we have a website with articles and an interactive service map and a content management system, a CMS, to manage that on the back end. Teams, uh, implementing teams themselves control that content management system. As I mentioned, we use social media and uh, we continue wherever possible to pair our program with Wi-Fi hotspots. Um, so then our platforms are the landing page and the starting point for refugees and affected communities accessing uh, Wi-Fi hotspots. And typically we're doing that in partnership with Mercy Corps or NetHope who are our big Wi-Fi um, uh, deliverers of Wi-Fi. 
Uh, we work in partnership at the global level. We are governed in a partnership with Mercy Corps still, uh, Internews, uh, and NetHope. Um, we also have a number of technology partners. And at the local level, we will typically work with um, partners, uh, in some cases, media partners who are really driving the content piece of it. Um, in some cases, legal aid providers where we don't have that capacity in the ground to sort of verify and validate uh, legal information and help us situate it in what they're seeing on the ground from their clients. Uh, and in some cases, we're partnering with uh, organizations that are doing um, service mapping already. We don't ever want to duplicate. So that partnership piece is really key. Uh, also key staffing. Um, these are the people who, who make it work, who run it. Uh, typically we work with editorial staff. Um, these are people who have backgrounds in journalism and whose role is to typically, and whose role is to uh, gather information, checking it with multiple sources and packaging it in a way that's gonna be accessible and appropriate for the platforms that we're sharing it on. Uh, where we don't have a partnership for service mapping, we hire our own service mappers who are going out uh, to different service providers and verifying the information that we put on the map, as well as just gathering information about accessibility for different segments of the population, which is really key for us. And then finally, we have social media moderators. These are essentially uh, digital liaisons. Their role is to receive questions about a range of topics Topics, and then using the information developed by editorial staff, guide people through that information, be a support, lend an empathetic ear, uh, and then also capture trends. So, and the, and the questions that they receive can be from how a certain policy affects them, to accessing a service, um, to decisions that they're trying to make about um, onward travel or other safety decisions. And finally, uh, a word about how we think about impact. Um, so we see our impact on the lives of people in crisis as a product of two things. The first is our ability to reach people at scale. So we need to reach people. Um, and the second is the extent to which they actually trust us. Um, this was mentioned by Matthew and it's so important for us. We just know that, that we're only gonna be successful in having an impact if people trust us. Uh, so a little bit in terms of our stats on the left of the slide. To date, we have uh, reached um, over 2 million unique users across our platforms. These are people who've actually engaged with our content. Uh, and we do surveys on trust, um, asking users about to the extent to which they trust us. Uh, a, a recent one, um, you know, said 88%. This is a kind of typical. Uh, we're working on developing better ways to measure this. It's tricky, but we are in the process actually of developing a, a framework for, um, for how we measure trust. Uh, uh, but in the meantime, uh, this is the this survey data is the best, but best we got. Uh, and then these things reach and trust um, really get to what the real impact is, um, which is people being able to make informed decisions, be, be better able to access service and to know and to be able to act on their rights. So here we have some figures also from some recent surveys where 81% said that signposts um, help them to make informed decisions, 60% said the information helped them to access a service, and 73% said the information helps them to know and exercise um, their rights. So, you know, in real term for us, this is this is really where we see the impact um, and where we where we believe that um, the the responsive approach, the individual support, um, and the and the content that is really driven throughout by users' needs is key. Uh, thank you so much. And I will leave it there. No, thank you, Brianna. That was very interesting and also very interesting to learn how the needs driven uh, combined with, with the tools and, and availability of, of digital communication forms that affected communities have can make basically a, a grassroots kind of um, organization, I guess, uh, make it work uh, and, and, and get in this way information to uh, affected communities. Thank you very much for this.
Um, we will now have two um, presentations by colleagues from the World Health Organization. And it's my pleasure to first give the floor to Javier Elkin, who is a technical officer in Be Healthy, Be Mobile uh, of the Department of Digital Health and Innovation at the World Health Organization, uh, where he provides technical assistance to countries in digital health and supports them throughout implementation of mobile health initiatives. Javier, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I am now sharing my screen. Please let me know when you can see the full screen presentation. Perfect, thank you. Great. So today I'm going to try to focus on giving you some practical advice and some lessons learned that we had from running a um, chatbot project for the past year that will hopefully be relevant to your field as well. And this really came out of the um, need to respond to the COVID-19 infodemic, which is, uh, came along with the pandemic, which was an overload and, and too much information that came from on, on the internet and on all sorts of media sources on COVID-19. And so this will specifically focus on the messenger channel on Facebook. So I'll be giving a very quick overview of the actual service itself. Then I'll focus on three lessons that will also deep dive on the key features. And then I'll also be sharing some resources for you to take away. So this is the actual chatbot that we launched in April, 2020. It was adapted from another chatbot that the WHO has. And here we have the English version. You can see how if you type English, you get the English version. You can ask questions such as what's happening in my country and get a flashcard with the latest cases and deaths. You can sign up to daily updates. You can ask questions like, is this is COVID caused by 5G? And you'll get responses in image format. And there's all sorts of questions that you can ask in real time and you can get responses from. So to give you an idea, uh, this service is available in 16 languages, although the English one is the only one that is conversational. If you look at the animation now, for example, it also offers video images. It, all, it offers also the ability to say things like, that's it, thank you. And it'll respond in a humanoid form. Um, on average, we have about nine free text messages that users sh send with us in a given conversation, which is quite a high number, considering these services are usually very robotic. And we rely on an algorithm uh, that runs in the background and detects uh, the questions and accurately matches them to specific content that we include in the bot through natural language processing. And right now, we've received over 11 million messages for, from about 1.3 plus million users. And we analyze these messages on a monthly basis to identify any key themes and topics that could be of importance to WHO. And from these, we actually include new responses and we add them based on these user questions. So to give you a bit of an idea of how this works, um, I'm going to be sharing the first lesson, which is listen to your users to drive content generation. So what does this mean? Well, when a user asks us a question, it sometimes results in a fallback, which is an error message that says, we don't have the answer to this question. And then on a monthly basis, we'll get an AI report from our private sector partner who will be telling us, these are the top 10 themes that people have been asking us about. We can group these questions into 10 themes. We'll be assessing the relevance of these questions to COVID because sometimes they're asking us about other things that WHO works on. And we'll be proposing answers that we have on our websites. And then from those, we'll be checking with our technical teams and provide official WHO approved responses. And we'll integrate these into the algorithm, we'll train them, and then we'll send out a notification text like this. And this has been an infodemic management loop. So this is a way for WHO to actually listen to its users, to the public, and answer questions and have a data-driven, a user-driven approach to respond to this intervention. The second lesson we have is to stay relevant. So throughout the pandemic, concerns have changed and we've been listening to users. So for example, at the first, when the pandemic first started, people were very confused about what COVID is and, and you know, can you take antibiotics? Um, how, what is the right way of sneezing? Does 5G cause it? There was a lot of myths surrounding this. So we worked with our communications departments to, um, and, and also we, we, we took this idea also from another chatbot service that was already running on another channel to have a fact or myth quiz where users would be able to interact in a gamified way with content about COVID. And we had over 100,000 people complete this. Then the concerns were more around, you know, what's happening in my country? 
And so we work with the dashboard, uh, that the dashboard team at WHO that have a live dashboard where they collect data from ministries of health on a, on a daily basis from all ministries of health and provide accurate information about latest cases and deaths of COVID-19. And we allowed people to subscribe to this service. And so we received over 2 million country queries and we now have over 70,000 daily subscribers to the service. And now, as you know, uh, the mental health has become a very key concern, right? In this later stage of the pandemic with COVID fatigue, the lockdowns, it's become difficult. And a lot of people have been telling us that they are experiencing uh, mental health distress. And so we've worked with the mental health department to include a self-help course, which, well, they, they, they actually created a guide for stress management, which they published online as a PDF. And we adapted that within this as a self-help course almost. It's like, it takes 15, 20 minutes. You learn five skills. And we found with a survey afterwards, uh, one week after they completed the all five skills, once they learn all five skills, over 86% reported that they have been using the skills at least one time a week in their everyday life. So we at least have here a way of measuring intent of behavior change as well. And of course, in the future, we're coming up with different things related to vaccine safety and vaccine updates and changing the flashcard to include vaccine figures as well. Third lesson, promotion is directly correlated with larger reach, but keeping users engaged depends on updates. So here on the left, you have a series of video ads that we included on, on Facebook and Instagram, which we worked, again, as a product of a partnership with Facebook and, and creative agencies to drive higher numbers of users. So when you see a service that says, oh, we've reached 13 million, 14 million, 20 million users on our service, this is usually how it's done <laughs> because it requires either funding or good pro bono partnerships. However, another key measure is how many users are actually engaged on a daily basis. And in order to do that, you need to follow lesson two, which is to stay relevant, but also to inform them. And to inform them, we send out push notifications, which some channels allow and others don't. And so here on Messenger, for example, we just say something like, we heard you over the past month, we've been listening to your questions and we've added answers to some FAQs, including, and then at the bottom here, you see the analytics, which just shows you on the X axis, uh, the, the date and on the Y axis, the count of how many people actually engaged with us, with the, with the chat box. And you can see those two peaks. We usually average around 30,000 users a day. And here we have 50,000 in February and 60,000 almost in March. And those, are push notifications that we send out and we re-engage users and remind them of the service and that will keep users engaged. And this is how you sustain very high numbers. Finally, I wanted to share with you a useful resource for chatbot for development projects. So we worked on this with, with UNICEF um, and Fatu who presented just before me as well. And we've captured here 45 lessons from our work and a very simple Excel sheet that you can find online and multiple teams and sectors and partners contributed from around different organizations of the UN. And you can find many more lessons on this, uh, on this document, which I didn't have time to share here. And for example, um, if you're gonna be working on a pro bono partnership, then you make sure you have a multi-year agreement to ensure sustainability or have a shared value agreement to ensure sustainability. And sometimes you may think that it would be great to have more languages included in your service, because you'll have more reach. But in reality, having a local partner will be much more, um, a more important factor to ensure success and drive reach because they will take ownership of this and they will have more, um, uh, they will know how to reach their own populations. And although it may not be um, from a marketing perspective, for example, although this may not be intuitive, images and videos can be equally effective for promotion on social media. And this is because different people like images and videos and not everyone likes videos. And images may be very quick and easy to do, whereas videos can take a long time. I've also shared here the link to a document in case you have chatbot projects that you want to contribute to this list. And you can also access the sheet with all the lessons learned at the bottom link, which will be shared around later. Finally, I just wanted to say thank you to all the contributors at WHO and different organizations who have been working on this. This has been a very uh, cross-organizational um, work from the communications team, risk communications, mental health department, dashboard team. We relied on private sector partnerships in order to do a lot of this. For example, Sprinkler was the developer who uh, through a pro bono collaboration through COVID was able to develop the actual chatbot. And we had a lot of uh, uh, credits, uh, ad credits from Facebook and Google that allowed us also to, um, that allowed us also to, to 
to share this service widely and many more, including the ad agencies, the source and so on. So we've also had a counter from uh, our users. We've had over 100,000 thank yous from our actual chatbot users to date. So these are some fun things that you can also do when you have a chatbot, you can start quantifying all sorts of data. And so I welcome, I, 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 I thank you all for your time and for listening. And I um, invite you to try it out yourself or share it with someone who you think might be interested and, and do feel free to get in touch with any more questions or answer on the Q, and I'll answer on the, on the Q&A. Thank you. No, thank you, Javier. That, that was uh, very good and very good to have three very concrete uh, learning points from the WHO in using digital tools uh, to, to, to answer questions and, and get in touch with, with uh, people. Um, we now go through to our um, second presenter from WHO. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Jamie Goof. Uh, she is a global health communications expert and she has been managing COVID-19 risk communication product development at WHO since May 2020, utilizing social media data to analyze and develop messages and products that support behavioral change. Um, Jamie, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. And I'm really excited to be here. And I love always listening to Javier. He gets me so excited about the work that we're doing. I just think he's fabulous. So what I want to do is to um, put into context a little bit of the work that we do, which is we're more on the content end. And when we're looking at it, we have this whole arc of behavior change from awareness all the way up to informed decisions. And we have different communication strategies for each one of these. And what I'm going to talk to, to the, about today is at the higher end of the arc of what we're trying to do with COVID-19 pandemic right now is that people need more individualized information and more community engagement. They've heard all of the top-down messages and now it's like, how do I relate this to my life? So um, what I'm going to show you is a suite of transmission products that we developed which were based on this concept of empowering people to manage their own risk. And we developed a risk meter as a tool to help them see where there's low risk and where there's high risk, a, a visual tool for them. And out of this, we've developed still graphics, animations, a risk quiz, and a community engagement toolkit. So here, this is um, the first thing that we Three did. factors can help you make safe choices it. when you're in an area of widespread COVID-19 transmission. Consider the location, the proximity to others, and the amount of time you spend there. Where does your activity take place? Open air spaces are always safer than enclosed spaces, particularly if they're small or without fresh air. Proximity to other people is also important. It's safest when there are fewer people around and you can keep more than one meter apart. How long does your activity last? The shorter, the better. Think about each of these factors and avoid situations where the risk dial is high. Small or poorly ventilated places and crowds of people for long periods of time. Stay safe. Lower the risk to yourself and others. So this was the first product that we made. And then Javier showed us the chatbot that he had done with the Mythbusters series that we had done. So we got thinking, okay, we have this content, we spent um, a lot of effort in developing it for an animation. Why don't we try to do it more interactive and give people a chance to do it? So we started working with Javier on this and we developed this online quiz with 10 questions. He recommended no more than that. And so we published it in all six UN languages and we pushed it out on our website and a number of different resources. So I'm gonna just show you examples of how the questions look. So we give, we ask a question, they answer it. And then the response is we, they get the, the risk meter and it shows whether it's lower or higher. It tells them also in text, your behavior helps you reduce the risk of contracting, keep up the good work. And then we give them a tip. Keep doing your part and always remember to, and then give them the tips. Now, here's another question, same thing with different uh, options, but in this case, here's an example of where someone would answer it in a high risk. So they get the visual of the high risk situation with red. We get text saying your behavior may be putting you and others at risk, and we get the tips also. 
So after about 10 weeks, um, we were able to track how people responded to every one of those 10 questions. So this is an example of one of the questions. And what's really helpful for us is to see how people are responding. And it helps us to target our messages better. So for example, with this one, whether people were going to indoor music venues, the large majority of them chose not to. Yes, great news. Um, and then the next one was that they were seated at least one meter from others and they do not sing along the best, next best scenario. So that's great. Here's another example of a question. If you have a job, where do you work? Half the people were at home teleworking, great low risk situation. But as you can see, um, a quarter of the people were still in a public place with many people coming and going. Not everyone can control where they are going. So that helps us look at that and then target messages for that group. So after about 10 weeks, we had about 36,000 people open the quiz, that myth buzzer, buster quiz that Javier talked about. It took about one year to, oh, sorry, I've got the wrong number here, for 100,000 people to open it. So um, we think we were doing pretty well. We had a 30%, 7% completion rate compared to what we believe our industry averages of 10%. People improved their scores of their perceptions of behaving safely. And the most important point for us is that 58% said the quiz motivated them to make behavior changes. So as Javier mentioned earlier, we're, we can't measure behavior change with these products, but we can measure intent. And we think that this is a, a good start. So the other point that I wanna make is that with all this content, and this is what Matthew had mentioned earlier, is we put a lot of effort into developing the content. We wanna make sure that we get it in many different formats. So we've reformatted this for a community engagement packet for trained facilitators. So on the left, you see, this is basically a PDF that people can download and print. Um, on the left is the, the, the uh, cover, and then what we've done in the middle, what they get is, one page where they look at one page and they see the question and then they flip it. And on the, on the right column, you see the answers. So instead of the, all the, the background figuring out the answer, it says, if you answered one or four, your risk, your behavior may be putting you at risk and using the color coding of red. And then if you answered two or three, your behavior helps you reduce the risk and then providing the tips. So just like the online survey, but in a different format. The other thing is we're always trying to evaluate this. So um, we tend to think that, oh, it's easier to evaluate in an online product because we can track all these things, but we can also do it with a print product. So we've taken those same questions and we've put them in this packet so that the trained facilitator in a group situation can ask these questions. People can raise their hands and they can use them as discussion points. So we think that this is very valuable. And then um, for the last, we've also taken this content and have adapted it for social media tiles. So in this case, we've taken the scenario of how do you go to a medical appointment and stay safe? And then we've also done them for downloadable PDFs as posters. So in this case, it was how do you go to the grocery store and go safely? So all these are in a whole variety of different types of digital and community engagement formats so that we reach across the, the house. So last thoughts from us, what we recommend is to try to do your content in multiple formats of your key messages. But then it's also important to look at your specific audience and, and others have talked about this. So how do you refine the language, the images, the tone and the format for that specific audience? And finally, evaluate each format to see what's working and how you can prove. So that's it from us and really looking forward to the further discussion and from hearing from you. Thank you. No, thank you, Jamie. And indeed, very good to, to, to see uh, how to uh, adapt the format to the different communities and how you try to reach them in, in, in different shapes and forms. So that's very interesting to learn. Um, and indeed, uh, allow me also to take this opportunity to encourage our participants uh, to put their questions in the Q&A or in the chat. Uh, the chat is already quite busy, uh, really had some questions in the Q&A and, and some of the panelists have already answered some of the questions. So please don't hesitate uh, to put any questions uh, in the Q&A or the chat if you have them. Um, and with that, uh, allow me to introduce 
um, Dr. Ifat Savar, who is the co-founder and chief operations officer for Se Sehat Kahani, a telemedicine startup based in Pakistan. Um, Dr. Ifat will talk about the role of telemedicine in enhancing healthcare access in humanitarian conditions. Um, Dr. Ifat, the floor is yours. Hello, everybody, and thank you so much for um, giving me an opportunity to share about the work that I do. And for fortunately or unfortunately, it's COVID time when I have a three year old toddler roaming around. So please, everyone, uh, don't mind if she just pops in into the camera. So I share the camera and uh, share the screen. And uh, um, till that time, I hope everyone can, can see it. Can you guys see my uh, screen? Yes, it's loading right now. Yeah, perfect. Yeah, yeah. So the name of the organization uh, of my company is Sehat Kahani, which essentially in Urdu means the story of health. And, and uh, just uh, I'll just briefly summarize what we do and, and then I'll talk about how telemedicine or my organization becomes relevant in humanitarian conditions. So I belong to a country, uh, Pakistan, which has a population of 200 million plus people, but because of social issues, more than 50% of the population does not get access to quality health care. And while there are multiple reasons for it, there are two primary reasons that we always foresaw. The first reason was that Pakistan does not have a structured primary health care network. And then everyone, when they get sick, they end up going to a tertiary care hospital. But the bigger problem that we are trying to uh, focus on is the case of missing doctors. Pakistan has more than 200,000 doctors collectively, but out of the 60% are female doctors who do not work to their full potential because of various social and cultural responsibilities. And the remaining doctors out of that around 12 to 20% leave Pakistan for better global opportunities, leaving Pakistan with the doctor patient ratio of one doctor for 1700 patients. And that's when me and my um, co founder, Dr. Sara Saeed, uh, realized that while there are a couple of challenges, the biggest opportunity that we foresaw was the growth of telemedicine globally. So telemedicine was estimated to be around a 38 billion US dollar market expected to grow and become a 175 billion US dollar market post COVID especially. And when we saw Pakistan, we saw that while 100 million people don't have healthcare access, almost the same number of people have access to smartphones, internet, and this number is on the rise. And that's when we came up with creating Sehat Kahani, which aims to democratize healthcare by connecting patients with need with online doctors using telemedicine. We started off in early 2017 and we do it in two mediums. The first medium or the primary area of work that we started or initiated was creating telemedicine-based e-health clinics in low-income communities, communities which were impoverished, which did not have any female doctor, at times not doctor, no doctor at all in that respective community. Uh, we started off by upgrading existing infrastructure, converting that into a telemedicine center, where a nurse from within that community gets the opportunity to connect people to online doctors. Uh, by 2019, we had created a wide network of such e-health clinics, and I'll talk about the impact in a bit. And we realized healthcare should not be limited only to the low-income population, but it should be widespread. And that's when we developed a mobile application, which allows people from the urban market people from any uh, income bracket, diaspora, or a geographical location who has a smartphone should be able to access a doctor online. And then came COVID. So interestingly, when we developed the mobile application for, for around three, four months, we did not get any usage. The download was very limited, but post COVID, I, I think one benefit that everyone was able to understand was that Given the crisis, people could access online doctors just from the comfort of their home through that smartphone, and people did not have to get unnecessarily exposed. This is just how a patient journey looks like in one of our telemedicine-based clinics. As you can see, a nurse becomes a facilitator in doing online consultations with doctors. And this is how a user journey looks like in a mobile application. We have been in the market for around four years. We have 35 e-health clinics as of today. For the mobile application, we actively work with the corporate segment where we have around 750 corporates covered 
through independent networks as well as through insurance providers. We've actively done more than 340,000 online consultations and we've impacted around 3.1 million lives through various health education prevention messaging programs and campaigns. The total network of doctors that we have today is around 5,000 doctors. Now, when we talk about COVID, the Lancet says uh, in an article in August 2020 that COVID is exacerbating the inequalities faced by individuals and families in humanitarian crisis. People are further forced to be pushed into poverty and other crises because of COVID. So during COVID, what Sehat Tahani uh, did was he made our services free for around four months. In those uh, four months, we were actually able to do more than 180,000 online consultations from various areas of Pakistan. A lot of this percentage was also COVID suspects. This was a geographical impact of all of those countries which were actually able to access this service that we were able to provide to people. We also scaled up our e-health clinic network with the support of Grand Challenges Canada and World Health Organization, two partners who actively facilitated us in scaling our network of e-health clinics. This year, we also ventured into Baluchistan, a province which is highly neglected in terms of healthcare. We also actively uh, provided mental health services to people within those communities who have our e-health clinics through the mobile application, as well as through other partner organizations, such as, for example, the Karachi uh, Central Jail, uh, British Asian Trust, a couple of partners that we are working with. I think one um, thing that I am really happy to share with all of you is that we got mentioned by The Economist this year for the work that we were doing in telemedicine. Now, telemedicine, what we realized in our four-year journey is that it can play a a very phenomenal role in enhancing the overall healthcare access in humanitarian conditions. When we talk about the challenges faced by explosive ordinance, we see that more than 5,500 people die every year because of such mine casualties. This is a global landscape. And as you can see, more than 50% of the entire globe is affected by such explosive remnants. A lot of families and children end up losing family members or body organs. Many children and families are displaced from their homes, in turn suffering for a long time by post-traumatic stress disorders. Entire lands become barren with no agriculture, school, or any other life. So again, I'll again mention one of our amazing partners, Global Challenges Canada, which enables Sehat Kahani to work in humanitarian communities. We work actively in KP, which is a humanitarian designated zone because of not only the terrorism that has happened in the past, but also because of frequent flooding that happens in that province. And we opened up five telemedicine e-health centers in such humanitarian communities. We opened up in late December 2020. Till date, we've impacted more than 10,000 lives in the last three months. And a lot of the impact is about to happen. We were also able to educate these communities on various healthcare issues pertaining to their day-to-day -day lives, how to uh, get resettled back into society, how to find work opportunities again. And for example, with people who again had mental health issues, we enable them to connect to psychologists and psychiatrists. Sehat Kahani as an organization envisions to be able to impact more than 50,000 doctors, physicians, and healthcare providers and bring them back into their network of healthcare provision. We want to be able to impact more than 25 million lives and enable them to access healthcare in one way or another using a digital medium. And we also envision to scale up into countries which have similar healthcare issues. A very interesting thing that I'll mention here uh, is that one of the clinics that we upgraded into an e-health center is actually built in a refugee camp, a refugee camp which was built during the Taliban wars in KP region, now works as a telemedicine uh, clinic in KP. So yeah, this is about my story and this is how we are trying to help people devoid of healthcare access in affected zones. Call 
Well, thank you, Dr. Ifat, for, for sharing your story and, and also for the contribution of your daughter at the end. It was uh, very interesting uh, to, to learn how e-medicine and telemedicine uh, can broaden uh, healthcare access uh, in, in, uh, in a country like Pakistan in, in, and also um, increase the participation of doctors in, uh, in such an ingenious way. Um, with that, I would like now to turn to the next uh, presenter, and I'm happy to introduce uh, Gay Monji. Um, Gay is a uh, country director for ya Viamo in Nigeria, and Viamo stands for v Via Mobile. He has 20 years of work experience as an entrepreneur and high level executive, which encompasses business development, technology, communication, marketing, project management, and international development. Uh, Guy, the floor is yours. Uh, Guy, you need to unmute yourself. No, still. We can see your presentation, but we don't have sound yet, Guy. All right, sorry about this. Can you hear me now? Yes, perfect. Please go ahead. Uh, yeah, I didn't realize I was on mute. Sorry about this. So my name is Guy. It's pronounced Guy, but I'm francophone, so I pronounce it Guy. Um, <clears throat> as it was said, I work for a company called Viamo in Nigeria. And basically, we are a technology company uh, focused on communication and mostly uh, capturing and disseminating information. So. The mission of Viamo is really to uh, provide people with the information that they need to make better decisions. And that can be uh, for a different sector uh, and different contexts. So humanitarian and non-humanitarian, agriculture, health, and so forth. Um, so um, the reason we like mobile is basically for a few reasons. So two-way communication. So we can speak to the beneficiaries and the beneficiaries can speak to us. We can localize the language. So for instance, in uh, Nigeria, there are five main languages, Hausa, uh, Igbo, Pidgin, English, and Yoruba. So we use those a lot, but we can also use different languages. Uh, it's uh, unlimited for us. Uh, another big reason for using mobile and um, interactive voice response is because it transcends level of literacy. So in sub-Saharan Africa, uh, the level of literacy is about 60%. So we don't want to leave 40% of the population um, unattended. So we, use, we like to use voice a lot. Again, penetration. So between 80 to 95% of households in Sub-Saharan Sub Africa have at least one phone. So uh, it's really important. And this is a very important channel. Uh, when you use um, internet, people need data. And you will see that in some contexts, people are afraid to use the internet because it costs a lot. Um, and a radio, is a, is a good channel, but not as prevalent as, as uh, the audio phone channel. Um, and TV is a great channel, but um, I think on average only 40% of the people have a TV, so you're missing a lot of people. Um, I'm gonna talk about IVR. So IVR is interactive voice response. So it's like, uh, hello, this is uh, UNICEF or this is WHO calling you. We want to send you an alert about COVID to listen to this message in English, press one, uh, in Yoruba, press two. So that's, that's interactive voice response. And the good thing about it is that every time you press on your keypad to answer, we capture it in our database and then we can easily extract the data and generate uh, dashboards to interpret the data. So I'm gonna, in the interest of time, I'm gonna speed up a little bit, but today what I want to do is I want to show example of 
PPP, private public partnerships. So how can we work with the private sector and government? So for Viamo, we have a product called 321. So 321 is a info line uh, in collaboration in Nigeria with Airtel. So we do it in about 25 countries in the world. And in different countries, we work with a different mobile network operator. So it could be MTN, it could be Orange, it could be at &T, um, depending on what country we're in. So in Nigeria, we, we work with Airtel, which is one of the four main carriers in Nigeria. Um, the way it works is that anyone that called the 321 short code, you dial 321 and it will say, welcome to 321. Uh, if you want to listen to content for agriculture, press one, for health, press two, for nutrition, press three, agriculture, press four, COVID-19, press five, and so forth. And then you can listen to content for free. Um, so with, in some countries, it's unlimited amount of phone calls per month. In Nigeria, Airtel accepted to give us 10 free phone calls per month per caller or per phone number. So you can make 10 free phone calls per month. And after the 10 calls, you only pay 10 Naira per, per call. So 10 Naira, I think it's about two or three cents. Yeah, 2.5 cents. So basically 321 is an audio info line. You can access content on demand. So it's like, imagine you're using your Netflix and you're watching movies. Well, with 321, uh, you're listening to audio. So it's more like a podcast or an audio book and you can educate yourself. Um, so we've done a lot with it. Uh, as I said, we got health, agriculture, education, financial, human rights, news. Um, in Nigeria, uh, we have about 500,000 unique subscribers. So those are the people that have registered. Uh, this year we had 400,000 unique colors, but last year uh, we had more than 10 million. So um, it's uh, for COVID-19, it's been really a great, great, great tool. Very sustainable because it's, it's free basically. And for Airtel is good because as people, since people need to have an Airtel SIM card to call the hotline, they are hoping that people will use their SIM card for other things than calling 321. So it's a win-win for everyone. Um, I want to give another example of, of uh, how we use our um, capabilities with uh, IVR, Interactive Voice Response. We work with Mercy Corps for um, a project called uh, Gaskia. And Gaskia really means truth in Hausa. And basically we wanted to debunk uh, false rumors for COVID-19. So what we work, what we did with Mercy Corp is uh, we set up a, a hotline with a call center, all software based from Viamo. So basically when you call the uh, hotline number, it will greet you. And then the software will, auto, uh, you will have some of your own staff working as operators with their own cell phone. And every day they can log on to the system online. And when someone called the hotline, the system will see who's connected and who's available. And whoever is available, we will write the phone call to them. If no operator is available, then there's another software called Issue Tracker that will allow people to leave a voice message and then create a ticket for the caller. So then when you want to listen to messages, you can go into your, your system, log in online, and you can just listen to the message online and you can comment. Like you can say what the user was calling about. Did you call him back or did you call her back? And did you left her or did you leave her a voicemail and so forth? So with this project uh, in Borno, uh, Northern, Northern Nigeria, we, we, we recruited 100 cruise champion and we asked them to call the hotline every time they heard a rumor. And then we helped them debunk the rumor. Is this a rumor or is this a truth? So we explained to them. 
And then if it's a false rumor, they go back in the community and they speak to the community and explain that this is not true. For instance, uh, uh, you cannot, uh, there's different ways of catching COVID, but some ways are, are false. So they will tell people how you can really catch COVID and how you cannot catch COVID. So uh, that's one of that's that's one of those. Um, the last example is uh, how we worked with the government of Nigeria and save the children. Uh, we did a mass communication campaign. Uh, so we called it Adbang because this time we sent SMS and automated phone calls. So we targeted 10 states. Um, we, we made sure that we, we would reach 50% women and 50% men. And we reached about uh, 2.5 million people. So, um, I, and we, we, uh, we recommended people that if they wanted to learn more about COVID-19, they could call 321 free of charge. So um, this was a, a, a great experience and again, very sustainable because of 321. Um, I'll pause here, is there any question? No, thank you, Guy. That was very interesting to, to learn about uh, an African perspective and, and how uh, you use mobile um, telephones to, to reach uh, communities, also taking into account the, the literacy rate uh, of your um, target group. Um, there is a, one final question, round of questions at the end, uh, but not before we have listened uh, to our final presenter. Uh, and I'm very pleased to introduce uh, Chris Houston, who is the Director of the Humanitarian Innovation at Grand Challenges Canada, managing the Humanitarian Grand Challenge Program. Um, Chris, the floor is yours. Thank you. Before this pandemic started, I was organizing a panel discussion about humanitarian innovation. I work for a program called the Humanitarian Grand Challenge. Um, but I also volunteer at my old employers, Doctors Without Borders, and in my day job, uh, I fund all these cool ideas, um, ideas that could change the humanitarian system. We fund telemedicine. Well, actually, you, you, you heard from Dr. Ifat. Um, we fund innovations that address COVID misinformation. We fund local manufacturing of relief goods. But one of the, thing that, one of the things that keeps me awake at night is the idea that we might fund all these cool things, but what if nobody ever uses the ideas in real life? Humanitarian workers are busy and if they don't know about all these new ways of working, we'll never use these new technologies or these new systems. We'll be stuck in the status quo, we'll be using old tools and not improving the humanitarian system. So I volunteered to run this event and I had this um, vision that, that we would have uh, innovators uh, talking about the, the cool ideas um, that, that, that they work on. So, so we would have HALA systems talking about their artificial intelligence system um, the early warning um, that they provide of incoming airstrikes in, in Northwest Syria. We'd have the Sentinel project talking about their rumor verification services that reduce the risk of genocide. I thought we'd hear from Sergi Box talking about the inflatable backpack that allows emergency surgery to happen in a sterile bubble outside an, an operating room. But the committee overseeing the event that I was organizing, they asked me to, to include a panel discussion. Now, uh, at that time, this report had just been published. Honestly, I find a lot of publications about humanitarian innovation are filled with jargon or they're too long or they're honestly just boring. Um, but this report was actually really good. Uh, Dan McClure, who is one of the authors, um, I knew him and I knew that he was looking for opportunities to, to collaborate. So I invited him to speak. But I also wanted to give space to innovators that, that we support. And so I asked James Tooch, um, he's the founder of an organization called Rainmaker. And I asked Natasha Fridas, she's a founder of an organization called Needs List. I asked them to speak as well. And I thought, well, I wonder what are they going to say, you know, because I've just put on Dan, the guy who just spent the past years doing the challenges with humanitarian. 
possibly add to to what the world's um, renowned expert might have to say. Um, so Dan gets on stage and and, and, he, and he, he eloquently explains the challenges of scaling up humanitarian innovation. He speaks about how, you know, in, in real life, um, or well, a normal world, you, you, you make an iPhone, um, you have to persuade somebody it's worth about $1,000. And if you do, you can sell it to them. It's a, it's a bilateral relationship between the people who make it and the people who sell it. It's difficult um, for humanitarians um, because the people who need the thing uh, usually don't have the money to pay for the thing. Um, and so they rely on a third party, the, the, the NGO, to, to, to pay for it. So, so the innovator in the, human, in the humanitarian space has two customers. So you have to persuade uh, the people they want to help that it's valuable, but they have to persuade the, the NGOs that it's valuable as well. And those NGOs, they tend to have relationships with donors that, that govern how they spend their money. So, so the, the humanitarian innovator, unlike the corporate innovator, has three customers that, 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 that they have to persuade. It's, it's really difficult to do um, innovation in this space. It's, it's complicated, it's dangerous. There's not so much money going around as compared to the private sector. Then the mic uh, goes to James to talk about how he sees the barriers to, to humanitarian innovation. James explains that as a refugee from South Sudan, he's often invited to speak on panels like this, but very rarely does he ever get given funding. Um, in, in fact, his organization is, is, is quite underfunded for the amazing work that they do doing solar powered irrigation in, in Tonge in South Sudan. James, James puts it to the room that racism is a factor um, in preventing humanitarian innovation succeeding. Natasha takes to the stage and she speaks about the amazing innovation that she has that, that connects people who have stuff to people who need stuff. And she told an anecdote about how she tried to pitch that solution to one of the world's biggest logistics firms, but they didn't buy her product. They, they bought what she said was an inferior product from some men in San Francisco that, that had developed something that was more expensive than her. She put it to the room that sexism was a, was a barrier um, in terms of scaling and, and funding and, and advancing humanitarian innovation. So it may sound to you um, that what I'm advocating for here is a, a more equal, a more just world with, with, with better equity. Uh, and it is, but there's also pragmatic reasons that um, we need to change the way that humanitarian innovation is funded. And it's not just about equity, it's about pragmatism. In the pandemic, the large humanitarian organizations are struggling to move people around. There are movement restrictions, there's reduced funding and the people that often respond to humanitarian emergencies overseas suddenly have needs at home. And so it may be obvious that local run organizations and local humanitarians understand the needs the best. It may be obvious that there's an equity issue here. Um, and yet still all the systems of privilege and power in this world uh, that we live in are present in the humanitarian system. Back in 2016, there was an agreement between the large donors, they called it the grand bargain, um, and they said that 25% of funding should go to locally, to local humanitarian responses. Um, but by 2020, when, when, it, when that 25% target should have been met, only 2.1% of the funding in the humanitarian system went to local organizations. When I, when I say that local organizations should be funded, it doesn't mean that international ones should not. There is a role for international solidarity. There is a role for partnership models. Um, these are important um, concepts. Um, but the funding and the power um, that goes to locally owned organizations is, is, is too low. Um, so I appreciate the opportunity to speak today and to be able to make that critique. Um, the organization that I'm part of is called the Humanitarian Grand Challenge, and we give funding and support to people that have great ideas that will improve the humanitarian system. The Humanitarian Grand Challenge is a partnership of USAID, of the FCDO, the Foreign Commonwealth Development Office in the UK, of the Netherlands Ministry of Foreign Affairs, and of the Government of Canada. And we give awards of up to a quarter of a million dollars to test new ideas, and we give awards up to three million to, to, to scale proven ideas. The question that I was asked to speak about today was what advice did I have to ensure that more, more, local, more local organizations could get funded? 
what I want to say is that the answer to that question is really uh, for us to contemplate as donors. Um, it's, it's donors that need to change our system to remove barriers to local organizations. If all we do is put our requests for proposals on, on, in English um, on a website, they're probably only going to be read by the people who are already in our network. If we don't reach out international, if we don't have conversations and we don't build trust internationally, we'll probably just get proposals from the usual suspects. If local organizations don't see us already funding other local organizations, they'll, they'll probably struggle to, to trust us. Um, and, and so as, as donors, we need to be mindful about who we employ, um, who we choose to do review processes, the diversity of our staff, what instructions we give to reviewers, specifically guidance around how to navigate things like unconscious bias. As for advice to, to people that want to get funding and um, people who are running innovations, here's how to get money from us. The first thing is pick a problem that you know really well, probably a problem that you face yourself. Assemble a team that has diverse and relevant skills and explain why what you propose to do differs from the status quo. Understand that innovation means new ways of doing things. It, it can be high tech, it often is, but it can also be low tech. It can also be process innovation. It can also be social innovation. It's important to read the request for proposals. It's amazing how many people um, submit proposal for funding and they've clearly not read the proposal or they've not answered the, the questions. And so that's my advice and I hope it's helpful. And if you have any more questions, then, then please visit our website, which is currently displayed on the screen or, or jump on the chat and I'll answer any questions. Thank you. No, thank you, Chris. That was uh, very good. And, and uh, indeed, uh, also from a donor perspective, uh, representing a donor country myself, it's always good to uh, be reminded uh, from time to time that uh, also we need to improve and do better and, and uh, pay more attention to what's happening uh, on the ground and, and how many people there are with good ideas. Because indeed, innovation does not have to be high tech. It can also be just a very good idea from somebody who knows how to make his life and his community a better place. So thank you for that. You're welcome. And also thanks to the Netherlands as being part of the, the partnership that, that I'm representing today. We're, we're, we're very proud that, that um, you're, you're part of this. Thank you, Chris. Um, with that, um, we are already uh, a bit out of our time, so to say, not to say almost half an hour, uh, but uh, I still want to uh, pose one final question to all the panelists. Uh, starting uh, with Fatou, um, and I would ask the panelists to answer the question, uh, but also to maybe share their final thoughts, uh, if any. Um, so uh, Fatou, if I may start with you, um, what is one piece of advice that you would give explosive organs risk education practitioners when it comes to using digital technologies to, to reach the most vulnerable and hardest to reach uh, people? Uh, Fatou, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. Just really briefly, I think what's really neat, and this has been really highlighted um, through this conversation, the variety of really brilliant and inspiring examples is that we don't have to start from scratch, right? We have so many models, we have so many um, tools and programming approaches and, and, um, and, and test either already tested or are tested modalities that we can really use and wield for, for, the, for the sector. So I think it's amazing in terms of fostering collaboration, really cross sectoral learning is really important. Um, is, and I think that's what's exciting. One, that the tools are there and so are the programmatic uh, uh, frameworks to learn from. Um, the second piece is what we as an entire sector and across all sectors are trying to do well. Hello. Um, really just collaborate. So I see this as an, um, an opportunity to collaborate with those that do community engagement really well, trust building, localization really well, working with governments as well, uh, looking at the different uh, technological tools that can help uh, remove the agenda. Um, and then thirdly is, you know, also working with donors that are equally keen um, to, to be creative and to meet the needs and the, and the infrastructure that is available uh, to ensure that we are reaching the most vulnerable and we're serving. So I just think it's an exciting time and I'm glad that we're not starting from scratch. We have a real opportunity to scale up in a meaningful way. Um, and that's exciting for the sector. Over. Thank you, Fatou. That was uh, very interesting. Uh, Brianna, one piece of advice and, and final thoughts. 
Sure, thanks so much. Um, and, and just, you know, echoing uh, everything Fatu said, I think those are brilliant points. Um, I guess I would add, you know, I think I would encourage EORE practitioners to really consider bundling their messages in a broader kind of responsive um, program wherever possible. I think that we have just found that as responsive as we can be, the more likely we are going to have meaningful engagement, the more likely that people are going to uh, listen to us and that there's going to be uptake uh, to the information. So that would be my one thought and over. Thanks. No, thanks. Very good. Javier, do you have a, a piece of advice and uh, some final thoughts? I think just specifically to, to my subject area of chatbots is first make sure that a chatbot is the right tool for you. It may be a very interesting and, 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 and very high potential digital channel to be using because it has a lot of uh, capabilities, but make sure it's the right way to do it and try to think about impact from the start. We had a question about this in the Q&A come up, and I think it's the one thing that is often it's the hardest thing and it's something we leave to the end and it should be at the beginning. So always try to think about how you're going to measure impact and how you're going to be reporting on it at the beginning. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Jamie, do you want to share some final thoughts and uh, also have a piece of advice? I'd like to follow up on what Robert Keeley said in the chat, which is about measuring the efficacy. I think if we start with what is the key information that you have to get, they really get that down well, and then also understand your audience, because you're at the question is about low resource settings and really understand their needs, and then just try out in one area a couple different things and put in the measures to evaluate it so that you can see whether they work or not. And then you can expand from there. But if you start small and you try a couple things that are manageable for you, that you don't get too far beyond trying to get something big, focus on your messages, you might be able to see what's working pretty quickly. Okay, thank you, Jamie. Uh, Dr. Ifat, do you also want to share a piece of advice uh, for the explosive? Ordnance Risk Education Practitioners, or we'll have some final thoughts, uh, also listening to the other panelists. I, I think uh, uh, digital medium is definitely an area which has been neglected for quite some time, and, and I think now is the time. And I strongly believe that with COVID, the experience that we all have started to have, um, with the ease that we can use digital mediums or utilize technology to do educate people is definitely on the rise. And I think we should maximize that. And if there's any support needed, Sehat uh, Kahani is here to be a part of you know, any organizations, uh, training department or any facility that you need from us in terms of digital health. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, Guy, do you have the same question? Uh, for me, it's uh, three points. Um, Number one is targeting. You have a digital, you have a digital intervention, so um, you you really want to target um, maybe to a specific state, to a specific specific uh, uh, gender, to a specific level of income. So we do a lot of that when we license from numbers from our. Uh, mobile network operators because they have databases and they can see the average income, they can see the gender, they can see the age, you can see the location. So th this to me is really important. And uh, number two, which was said, I think it's uh, Jamie, I think about testing. I feel like every time we deploy something, we do a pretest to ensure that do they understand the accent, the voice, the language. We always do that because we've seen before that you can deploy something and the idea is good but because you didn't test you fail so testing 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 and uh, the third point is sensitization so are the people ready to receive the intervention because sensitization for us it means we let's say we work with who or unicef we will say hey this is unicef calling you we would like you to answer our survey and we will we will ask you question for maybe every week for three weeks or four weeks so before we start the intervention we like to let people know who we, who we are 
why we're calling them and what's in it for them. How is it going to, going to benefit them? So that way they are more likely to participate and your conversion rate is a lot higher. So that's it for me. Now, thank you, Guy, and uh, those were three very concrete uh, lessons uh, that we can all take away uh, with us. Um, and then finally, Chris, do you uh, have any piece of advice that you would like to share with uh, us and, and maybe some final thoughts? It's interesting times that we live in just now. Sometimes you look at the news or you look out your window and it feels a little bit dystopian. I, I, I think the challenges that we're facing um, the, the issues of misinformation that we're hearing about today are, are very real in the humanitarian space and just the world we live in. You only need to go on Facebook or Twitter and see what your uncle's tweeting to, to see that misinformation and disinformation seems to be reaching all of us. I think this is a challenge um, that the digital communication tools can, can really address. I think this is the, one of the, the greatest you know issues that, that, that we face right now. I think also telemedicine is, is, is an incredible um, driver of equality with, with lack of access to, 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 to good medicine, whether it's because of poverty or because of violence or, or because of, of systems of inequality. And, and, and I think also that the digital tools that, that we're speaking about can really advance things like local manufacturing, which has been so uh, so important as global supply chains are ruptured and, and people need personal protective equipment and things like that, using digital tools to get information, whether it's health information, whether it's addressing misinformation or whether it's making PPE. Um, I, it's, it, it's good to see technology being used for good in a time when it's also being used for, for harm. And, and, and um, I see these as the, the key areas where uh, the world could be made a better place. Um, thanks for the chance to speak about it today. No, thank you, Chris. And, and uh, I think uh, with that, it's uh, time to conclude this panel, uh, but not before uh, I have thanked all the panelists for their presentations and their insights. Uh, also from uh, my perspective, working mainly on disarmament and, and the mining issues. It was very interesting to learn so much about WHO and other humanitarian organizations, UNICEF, uh, as well as telehealth. Um, so I think there were a lot of takeaways and, and, and lessons learned uh, for all of us on how to use digital tools uh, to uh, get the behavioral change that we all want uh, to make the world a safer and better place. Um, with that, uh, I also should thank the Geneva International Center for Humanitarian Demining for hosting us and uh, for having us a very flawless and, and great uh, webinar. Uh, I'm looking to Caitlin or Mathieu uh, if they want to say any concluding remarks on behalf of GSCHD. And if not, uh, Mathieu, you want to speak? No, I wanted to thank you, especially Rain, the Netherlands for uh, moderating this brilliantly. Thank you everyone for attending. And again, a million thanks to all the panelists from the, this, all the diverse organizations. Uh, I think there was a lot of thought provoking ideas and we hope that um, through this webinar, new, new seeds have been planted uh, and this is not the end of it. It's just, a, it's a process. Thank you. No, thank you much. Uh, well done. Let me conclude here, but not uh, before to thank to one more time the panelists and also uh, our participants for this participating and putting the questions in the chat. Um, many of them have already been answered, uh, but we will see if there are any more questions that need to be answered in writing uh, and we'll make sure that uh, those answers will reach you as well. Once again, thank you for participating. Thanks to our panelists and thanks to GICHD and have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Bye, thanks everyone. Thank you. Bye.